women, young adults, and special interests, or if you just want to make friends. We have groups that meet in person and even groups that meet online. And if the perfect group does not exist for you, it might just be the one you create. It's the perfect way to follow Jesus and love people. So download the Westover app and join a group today. Here at Westover, our mission is simple. Follow Jesus, love people. You may be asking what exactly that looks like. So we've created two classes specifically designed to help you understand each part better and equip you to take your next step of spiritual growth. We believe following Jesus is the first step in your spiritual walk. So our Follow Jesus class will help you discover how you can grow in your faith, learn more about who Jesus is, and give you practical tools to strengthen your relationship with him. At Westover, loving people looks like getting connected. In our Love People class, you'll get a deeper look into all the opportunities we have for you and your family. You can sign up to join or lead a life group, be part of a volunteer team, and find the resources you need to take your next step into connection. We believe it's good to grow, and we know that each of these classes will help you discover what God has next for you. Hey, I'm Albert Santiago, and I'm the director of Westover Hill Sports Ministry. Westover Sports is the largest community outreach Westover Hills Church has to offer. Between soccer, flag football, basketball, softball, and volleyball, we have something for everyone. Westover Sports isn't just for our youth athletes. We have plenty of adult leagues as well. If you're around Westover Sports long enough, you'll hear us say it's more than a game. You see, we believe through sports, we can help develop character and integrity while honoring God. If you love sports, serving people, or want to try something new, Westover Sports is searching for dedicated volunteers to help maintain our programs. You can download the Westover app to find what's available or visit our website at westoversports.com for more information. We look forward to seeing you. At Westover, we have experiences for kids of all ages. In early childhood, we are opening the eyes of infants and preschool age children to the wonders of who God is with three basic truths. God made them, He loves them, and He wants to be their friend. We demonstrate this with fun and interactive elements like worship, small groups, and lots of love. If you feel more comfortable keeping your child with you, the Wiggle Giggle Room is available during all services. This room is open for one parent and a child to enter an environment that allows the children to be more active while their parents are still able to enjoy service. In elementary, your children, kinder through fourth grade, come to a Westover Kids service where they'll engage in dynamic worship and biblical teaching. Most of their time is spent in their small group to help them form life-giving relationships with their group leader and other kids their age. Together, they learn about the Bible and how to have a relationship with God, memorize scripture, and have fun developing friendships with each other. Our goal at Westover Kids is to introduce your kids to Jesus and create a space for them to experience him at each phase of life by bringing the Bible to life. Our teams provide a safe, fun, and engaging experience where your child can be paired with a leader to guide him through service and to a closer relationship with Jesus. For students 5th through 12th grade, we offer service experiences that strengthens their faith. It builds relationships and helps them answer the hard questions of life. Our goal is to be a space where students feel welcome and where their friends become family. Each service, students will be a part of a life-giving worship. They'll be encouraged through age-appropriate messages and connect with leaders and peers in small groups. You can visit any of our next-gen environments today.
Watch it over. It's a great day to be in church today. Come on, all across this place, would you put your hands together and lift up a sound of praise? Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, and praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, and praise when surrounded. Cause my praise is.
no matter what we go through if we seek him surely we will find him so whatever it is that you're facing can we look back on the past on how he's been faithful and can we allow the faith to rise in this room as we sing together with one voice that I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why i trust him i saw the lord and he answered Hey! 
for worshiping with us today here at Westover. Whether you're joining us here in the room or you're a part of our online community, we are so excited that you're with us today. Will you turn to two or three people around you, share your very best smile, and then you may be seated. Welcome to Westover. My name's David. We're so glad you're here. If it's your first time joining us, we want to connect with you. You can scan the QR code or fill out a connect card and drop it in one of the contribution slots. Or bring it to Guest Central where after every service, you can get to know our lead pastors. If you're joining us online, make sure to connect with us by clicking the link in the description. Are you brand new to Westover? We want to get to know you. Join us today after third service for Sunday Social, an event for new people. It's the most exciting way to learn more about us, meet our lead pastors, and find your Westover community. Register online and we'll see you there. Thank you for joining us this weekend. You can stay up to date with all that's happening by following us on social media at Westover Hills. To learn about or register for any upcoming events, download the Westover app or visit westoverhills.church slash events. Until next time. Well, hello and welcome to Westover, whether you're here in the room with us or you're part of our online family. We're so thrilled that you're with us today. And if this happens to be your first time with us, you truly honor us with your presence. And we'd love to connect with you. So we invite you to fill out the connect card that's found in the seat back that's right in front of you. You can fill it out by hand or you can fill it out digitally by scanning the QR code. We just love to know that you're with us today. And if you happen to be with us on site, my wife, Pastor Danae, and I would love to meet you and your family at Guest Central in the main hallway at the end of service. We'd love to meet your family. We'd love to get to know you a little bit more and just share God's grace to you today. Thank you so much for joining us. But today we have the great privilege of continuing to worship the Lord through giving. And when we give to God, we give out of the gratitude in our heart for what he's done for us. It's not that we're paying a transaction it's that we're saying thank you. We're saying thank you to Jesus for what he's done for us already. And I'm here to tell you, if he didn't do one more thing, he's done more than enough by giving his life for us. And so we have the opportunity to return the tithe, which is the first tenth that he gives to us. And we give that joyfully and also kingdom builders as well. But I want to share with you that your giving makes a kingdom impact. It allows us to extend the heart of God to people in our community. And I want to share with you just a praise report from just a handful of days ago. We had 80 people get baptized right after Easter. And Westover, I want to say thank you for being so generous to giving to the kingdom of God because it allows us to extend the heart of God to people who need to hear from him. I also want to share with you there's a benefit that comes with giving to God and being generous. And this, these are the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says this in verses 7 and 8. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. We need to give cheerfully unto God. But I also want you to realize that researchers have just found out that people who are generous... People who give generously of their life and their resources, they're actually more happy. And I want to share with you that what researchers have found recently is something that the Word of God has told us for thousands of years, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. We don't give to get from God, it's that we get to give to Him, and we want to make a kingdom impact. So I just want to invite you to give out of the joy that's in your heart, and I also want to share with you that as you give, I believe God's going to deposit joy in your heart, a joy that's unspeakable as we give unto him. So right now I invite you to pray as we prepare our heart for today's message. God, we come to you. It's our great privilege to return the tithe to you, to give an offering to you, to say thank you for how good and faithful you are. I pray, Lord, you bless your people today. May they sense joy as they give to you. May you return that joy to them and prepare our hearts for today's message. God, help us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen.
Well, today we're continuing our series called Picture Perfect, where we look at our life and our relationships through God's eyes, not the eyes of the world, or what the world prescribes and tells us our relationship needs to be. Because the world has a plan for your life that won't help you, that won't help you move forward in your life and relationships. So don't go to Netflix, don't go to movies to get an idea of what relationships need to be. Go to God's Word, and He'll tell you what you need to do to advance. And so today, uh, my wife, Danae, is with me. We're going to tag team, and we're going to talk about marriage. We want to talk to you about how we can live out biblical marriage, God's way, and how we can move forward. You know, when you get engaged and you begin to plan your wedding, ladies, you want the perfect dress, the perfect venue. You want those perfect pictures to capture your perfect day. But then after you finish the wedding, what do you do after I do? I mean, how do you actually live out until death do us part? We like the idea of the for richer and in health seasons, but sometimes there are poorer and sicker seasons in marriage. You know, in marriage, there's not a multiple choice where you get to choose the season and the, the type of marriage that you're going to have sometimes. Sometimes there are seasons that are great. So there are struggles. There are celebrations. You experience everything. And so today we want to share with you, what do you do and how do you live out after I do? And so we want to go to God's word today. To get an idea about how to live in our relationships after I do. You see, a lot of times what happens is that couples spend a lot of time preparing for the wedding. They want everything to be perfect. But I want to encourage you to plan after the wedding. Plan for your marriage to thrive and for the future that God has for you. And so today I want to invite you to join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And while you're turning there, I just want to share with you a little bit about what's happening in this specific a passage. Uh, this book was written by a guy by the name of Paul. He was a first century follower of Jesus. Many of us know him as the Apostle Paul. And he was writing a letter to people in the city of Corinth. And he was telling them how to live like Jesus in a world that doesn't acknowledge Jesus. How we can live out our relationships in a way that is a testimony to people who don't yet believe. And this chapter, chapter 13, is called the love chapter. So if you want to know what love is all about, this is the chapter to read. So I want to invite you to join me at the very last verse, uh, verse 13. Let's look at God's word today. And I just want to encourage you to open your heart, whether you're dating, engaged, married, or someday you want to be married, because I believe God's word applies to all of us. Let's look at verse 13 together. It says this, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. Say those three with me. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. love. The greatest of these is love. In these few words, Paul gives us a prescription for relationship success. He's telling us this is what we need to do in our relationships. We need to make sure to express faith, hope, and love. And I just want to encourage you to open your heart. Because I believe God's going to deposit something in your heart and in your life that is going to unlock something, a place where you might be stuck in your relationship to move forward. And the first one I want to share with you, the first practical way to live after I do and thrive is to put faith first. Put faith first. Let faith be the foundation of your life, your marriage, and your family. Here at Western, we believe that strong faith builds a strong family. And so faith is the foundation. And if you build your life on Jesus, it doesn't matter what comes. You have something solid to stand on. Mm -hmm. And faith is that foundation that God's created for us. In fact, faith gives us confidence about the future. The writer of Hebrews, in chapter 11, verse 1, this is what he says. Now faith is confidence. Say confidence. Confidence. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance. Say assurance. And is assurance about what we do not see. Faith is what allows us to believe for more in our relationship. To believe that God can and that he will work in our life. Because that's the spiritual confidence we have in God. God always does what he says in his word and we can rely on him. We can trust that he is faithful to his word. And if we're willing to build our life and our family and our relationships on Jesus, we can move forward. You know, and cultivating faith in your relationship is not going to just happen on its own. 
you have to be intentional about it. When John and I first met and we started dating, we were both believers. We were both serving God. We were both attending church and going to church. And when we were dating, we were having faith conversations. But when we got married, we realized we needed to be intentional about building faith in our marriage. That we had to do more than just have faith conversations. And so over the 17 years that we have been married, this is something that we have intentionally had to work on. But I encourage you to make this an intentional part of your marriage because there's a richness and a deepening that will happen in your relationship when you focus on deepening the faith in your marriage and not just the personal faith that you have with the Lord. And so today we want to share with you just a couple of ways of how you can put faith first in your marriage. And the first one is to pray for each other. Pray for each other. Prayer is spiritual insulation for the heart. Prayer is something that keeps you from getting bitter, resentful, selfish, prideful. Pray for your family and pray for your marriage. Put the enemy on notice that you're interceding for your family and your marriage. And this is something, yes, yeah, absolutely. This is something that Danae does a great job in our relationship. I see her consistently praying over our family, praying over our kids, praying for us as a couple, and even praying for me. One of my favorite moments all weekend is when my wife and I, we gather together before one service happens, and we pray together. And I like praying for her, and she prays for me, and she prays that God would allow his word to be spoken, and that people would walk away knowing that they've heard from God. And I'll just tell you, as a husband, it is so life-giving to have a wife that prays, and I'm grateful for her and how she lives that out. And I want to encourage you to pray. Why? Because couples that pray together stay together. Yeah. Couples that pray together yeah. stay together. Why? Because when you pray together, <clears throat> you're creating spiritual intimacy. And that intimacy will actually overflow into the rest of your relationship. And here's what, here it is. They've discovered that couples that pray regularly and read God's word regularly have a less than 1% chance of getting divorced. Yeah. So if you want to divorce, proof your marriage. Let faith be the foundation yes. of your relationship. And you'll discover that God will step in and he will protect you from the attack of the enemy. Yes. Another way. Yes. Another way to really live out faith in your relationship is practically to invite the Holy Spirit into conversations before, I'm going to say it again, before they become disagreements. Because here's what happens. Sometimes things go a little wrong in a conversation. You say something, they misunderstand, and then all of a sudden you're in a fight. You didn't realize this. You're putting on boxing gloves and it's on. Here it is. When we invite the Holy Spirit into a conversation before it gets to a disagreement, what we're saying is, God, I want you to speak to me and I want you to speak through me. Because sometimes when we end up in a conflict, we're actually saying to God, hey, guess what? I've got this. You can stay out of this. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we need to ask the Holy Spirit to step in and to make an impact in our relationship and to speak through us. I believe he can anoint our words and our ways so that we honor God, honor each other, and we walk away more connected than before. And this is something that the Holy Spirit really dealt with me on early in our marriage and our relationship is I would find that we were in a conversation and I wouldn't invite the Holy Spirit into that moment. And I would just hear him whisper, you are making this worse. And I just had to learn over time to invite the Holy Spirit in and he will, he will be able to speak to you. He will be able to guide you in that conversation where he will help you understand and know how to get to the heart of your spouse, how to get through the message that he wants you to share. And maybe it's sometimes, hey, I need you to be quiet right now. Or sometimes he will give you the words to say because you need to be fighting for your marriage and not against it. So I invite you, bring the Holy Spirit into those conversations. Another way that you can put faith first in your marriage is to put Jesus first and center in your life. Put Jesus first and center in your life. I know that it sounds simple, but I think sometimes we can get caught in misprioritizing things. Here's how things need to be prioritized. God is first, your spouse is second, and your kids are third. God is first, your spouse is second, and your kids are third. And moms, can I just share with you and speak to you? Let me share my heart. Sometimes I think we unintentionally will put our kids first. We don't even realize that we do it and we put our kids above our spouse. And what we have to remember is this is until death do us part. Your kids are eventually going to leave the household. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They are going. 
They've Love got them. a limited timeline. God in bless the house. you as you go. Absolutely. But this is until death do us part. And so I, I would invite you to remember that your relationship with God is eternal. Your relationship with your spouse is until death do you part. But your assignment as a parent transitions from parent to coach when they turn 18. And so I invite you, always put God first and your spouse second. Because you love your spouse the best when you love God the most. Say that again. You love your spouse the best when you love God the most. So make sure that you put Jesus first and center in your life. The Word of God tells us that when we put God first, and we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, everything else is added to us. Mm -hmm. What that means is that when God is first and center in our life, in our relationship, it's going to work. That's the way we're intended to be. Our spouse is the best place for them to be is second, because when we put God first, we'll never come in second in our relationship. God can move forward. So Paul talks about how we need to have faith in our relationship, but then he speaks about hope and how hope is essential. Another way to think about hope is to believe the best. Believe the best. Believe the best about your spouse. Believe the best about your marriage. Believe the best about your future together. Because what we believe is what we notice from our spouse. So if we believe that they have the best of intentions for us, we believe that they're behind us to support us, that they're going to advocate for us, that they're going to encourage us, then those are the things we notice. And those are the things we pay attention to. But if we believe that our spouse is out to get us, that they don't care about us, that they're not there to support us, what's going to happen is we're going to see more of that. Why? Because sometimes we we encounter the humanity of our spouse, and they're not going to be perfect all the time, and they're going to have a small moment where they're just going to have a little bit of their humanity come out, and we're going to turn just a small little situation into an offense that we then carry. And when we carry offenses, what happens is we begin to say, That's how they are. And we begin to write a narrative that God isn't writing about the future of your relationship. So believe the best about your spouse and the future you have together. Because your spouse will become what you believe. Your spouse will become what you believe. What you you celebrate gets replicated in your relationship. And this is what the verse talks about is to have hope and have hope in your relationship. And so I just want to invite you. In this verse it says hope. And really what this what hope means in this verse is to expect the good. Just expect the good. And so I invite you, believe the best and expect the good in your spouse. If we come into conversations expecting the worst, then we're going to come in guarded. But if we come into conversations and we're expecting the best to happen, then we're going to come in and give the benefit of the doubt. And ladies, I just want to remind you and talk to you, it's really easy for us sometimes to have this internal dialogue about the things that frustrate us about our husbands. Sometimes we get nitpicky and we pick on the things that bug us. Oh, he didn't put his clothes in the laundry basket, forgot to take out the trash, he left a mess in the kitchen. And so we just start noticing all of those things and then we have this internal dialogue that's going, man, he never does this. And, da, 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 da. and we just keep going and going and going. And then we're all worked up over the situation. And then when we go to him and address it, he's completely clueless that we're frustrated. <laughs> completely clueless. And so this week, what I want to invite every wife here is that for seven days, seven days intentionally look for something in your husband that you appreciate and that you love about him. Find something every single day to appreciate about him, something that you love about who he is, and then share with him every single day what that thing is. Look for it in your spouse. Is it that he's great with the kids? Is it that maybe he just fixes stuff around the house and takes care of things? Maybe it's just that he's consistent day after day going to work and providing for your family. Whatever it is, look for it and tell him that you appreciate that because what you praise, you're going to get more of. We know that as, as we're parenting, but I just want to remind you about that in your marriage. Praise the things that you appreciate about your husband. And can I also challenge just the guys in the room? Can I just invite us to do the same for our wives? She shows up and gives her life and her heart to the family, and we need to say thank you. Sometimes we've been discipled as men just to expect certain things, the house to be clean and and the food to come right in front of us, 
And your, my, your wife may want to do that for you, but a thank you can go a long way. And so I'm here to challenge the guys, when you see your wife do something that you very much appreciate, just don't appreciate her on the inside. Be willing to share it as well. She needs to know that you appreciate and you notice what she does. And I just want to invite the guys right now, if you're sitting by your wife, to turn and say to her, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Do it right now. Say thank you. It makes a difference. And when you believe the best and you want to bring hope into your relationship, I want to encourage you, extend grace. Extend grace in your marriage because I know that your spouse is not perfect, but neither are you. God is the only one that is perfect. Yep. God is the only one that is perfect. And God does not perfect, expect perfection out of you or your spouse. So who are we to expect more from our spouse than God does? Good. It's for us to just every single day show up, extend grace, and give our imperfect best. And what I would say, yeah, what I would say is that if someone, if your spouse extends grace to you, I want to encourage you to guard it. Yeah. Guard that grace that they're giving to you. Why? Because grace <clears throat> is something that we appreciate, something that helps us move forward in our relationship, but it's not intended to be uh, just taken advantage of. You see, marriage is intended to be 100 and 100, not 50-50. It's each person bringing their imperfect best yeah. to the relationship, knowing that their imperfect best is good enough, and knowing that God will bring his perfection, and together he'll take just two ordinary, ordinary people, and he will make a miracle out of your marriage if you're willing to step in. And I just want to share with you, let me just make it practical about us showing up as guys. Now, guys, I want to tell you what women want, okay? I know you've been wondering for decades what women want. Okay, guys, what women want is they want a guy with muscle and hustle, okay? <laughs> muscle and hustle. That means it's showing up, giving your very best, taking care of yourself, making sure to be dialed in because lazy is a great way to be lonely. So if you want to be lonely, be lazy. But even more than that, I think being able to show up and give your very best is what God expects. In fact, Paul writes to his, his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 5.8, he says this, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. What he's saying here is this, is that we have a spiritual responsibility to provide for our family. And that provision isn't just financial. Yes, we need to show up and provide financially. But I think what we see from the life of Jesus is he provides to us in a variety of ways. He provides for us emotionally and spiritually and relationally. And as husbands, we need to show up like Christ, the way Christ loves his bride, the church. And we need to be sacrificial. We need to show up. We need to show relational kindness. We need to show appreciation. We need to show tenderness. We need to correct our children. We need to also make sure our children know that they are loved. And so this idea of provision isn't just financial, it's much more than that. And when we do that, we're actually reflecting faith in Jesus. What I would also say, guys, if you've been married for a while, I want to encourage you to pull out the playbook that you had when you first started dating. Because what you did back then worked to blind them for a moment so they marry you. Yeah. And if it worked back then, I think it's going to work again. So go back to that playbook, and I just believe God can work in that. But what I would say, though, often what happens in conversations like this is there might be a handful of you who say, you know what, Pastor John, that's great. I love these ideas. They're great for couples that are doing all right. But you don't know what we've been through. You don't know the hardship that we face. You don't know the difficulty that we've had with extended family. You don't know the people that we've lost. You don't know the way we fought against each other, the way we've hurt each other. You don't know the pain and the woundedness that we're experiencing. And the truth is, I may not, but God does. Yeah. And when we find ourselves in that place, here's what I know, is that God gives us hope. God gives us hope. And hope has a name, and hope's name is Jesus. And yes. he wants to step in and bring healing and yes. restoration to your relationship. If you're willing to hold on to hope, if you're willing to hold on to him, he'll step in and he'll begin to create a transformation 
in your relationship. And what I would say, this is one way to remember hope. One way to remember hope is H-O-P-E. Hold on, pain ends. Hold on, pain ends. Hold on to Jesus. And I know that as you hold on to him, even when you can't seem to hold on to your spouse, as you hold on to him, he will then bring you back together and heal your hearts together. Now Paul, he says, faith and hope are essential, but then he says, love is the most important. It's the greatest of all. And so here's one practical way to live out love, God's love, in your relationship. And it's to choose love every day. Choose love every day. Even on the days when you don't feel like it. Choose love every day because love is a choice and an emotion. It's a, lo- it's a noun and a verb. It describes what we're supposed to share between one another, but it also prescribes. It tells us that this is something we must do. And love is something that is essential. You see, when Paul was writing to the people in, in the city of Corinth, what he's telling them is this, is don't pursue just the passionate love, which is called eros, which is what the Greeks were pursuing. He says, pursue the love of God and share the agape love with your spouse. It's that everyday love that gets you through. So choose to love every day. Choose to love even when you don't like them. Yep. Be willing to love them through. Because the truth is, Jesus loves us that way. He loves us even when we do things that break his heart. Yeah. He continues to love us. Someone once said, love is not only something that you feel, it's also something that you do. And I want to challenge you, choose love every day. And so you might be wondering, okay, how do I do that? How do I actually practically choose love every day? Especially sometimes when I don't feel like it. Well, I want to encourage you to date your spouse. Date your spouse. You dated them to get married and you have to continue to date them to build on that relationship. And so intentionally find time, schedule it, put it on the calendar. If we don't put it on the calendar, it doesn't happen. And so date your spouse. Maybe it's that you guys go out for lunch or you meet up for coffee. Yes, coffee. Yes, coffee coffee. is the the way to his Yes, coffee, that's biblical. (laughs) So... Or maybe it's that you go out to dinner one night. Or sometimes if that's not even possible, put the kids to bed early and just do a movie night together. But find time. It doesn't have to be a lot, but be intentional and find time to do things together. And then I want to encourage you to do things that the other one likes just because. There doesn't have to be a special moment or an occasion or a celebration in order to do things that they like. Do it just because. Just because you love them. Maybe make their favorite dinner just because. Mm. Or bring home their favorite Starbucks order just because. Again, see, there it is. There it is. <laughs> or maybe it's just that you send her flowers just because. Okay, let me pause here. Guys, <laughs> flowers work all the time. And the ladies say amen to that, right? Yes. Any day that ends with Y is a great day to send her flowers. I promise you it's going to brighten her day. Yes. Also, I want to share with you guys another way to really live this out is clean up the kitchen, do the dishes, put the kids to bed yes. early, and you, I promise you, you'll get more mileage in your relationship if you're willing to just take care of the things around the house because these are yes. things that she is worried about and she's thinking about, and if she comes home and you've already taken care of it, she's going to be like, oh my, I love you. Yes. I promise you it'll work. And then finally, I would encourage you to make time for connection and each other. Sometimes this becomes something that goes out of sight and out of mind, especially in the ebbs and flows of your marriage. And there are seasons where you can kind of drift apart. I want to encourage you to make time for connection. And so maybe while you're out and about, just grab his hand and hold on to his hand. Increase the PDA between the two of you. Remind each other of why you love each other. And then maybe you hug and you kiss in front of the kids. I want to encourage all of our parents to remind you that you are modeling for your kids and creating a worldview and a filter and perspective for them of what marriage looks That's like. Right. How you live out your marriage is setting a filter and a perspective for what they know marriage to be. And so I encourage you, let them see a healthy marriage. Let them see you love each other. And if you ever do have a disagreement in front of the kids or conflict in front of them, then always resolve it in front of them. Let them know that conflict exists. No marriage is perfect. It's two imperfect people. But through that, you can work through conflict and you can reconcile and you can move on and it doesn't end 
into the relationship. Model for them what healthy relationships look like. Because our marriage is intended to tell the truth about who God is. Yeah. It's intended to reflect the unity that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have together. And so when we allow God to be at the center of what we're doing and we're sharing love with one another, what ends up happening is God shows up and he brings us together and he creates that unity because our marriage is intended to be a testimony to a world that doesn't believe in marriage. And let me just say publicly that biblical marriage is between one man and one woman yes. forever. That is what God's design is and that's what biblical marriage and that's what he blesses. Yeah. But I want to give you a bonus here about one way to show love in your marriage and this is for the guys. I want to encourage you to be her CEO. Now, before you think something strange about that, what CEO stands for is Chief Energy Officer. Chief Energy Officer. It is your job as her husband to steward her energy because when she expends her limited energy on everything else, she has no energy for you. So make sure to put the kids to bed. Make sure to take care of the chores. Make sure to ensure that the kids clean their room and do the stuff that they need to do. Why? Because when you're able to steward her energy, she can then provide that energy and focus into your marriage. And it's essential. I also want to say that love is more than just an emotion. It's more than just something that we do. It's something spiritual. You see, love, it is the first fruit of the Spirit. It's the first fruit fruit of the spirit that the holy spirit cultivates in us and i want to speak to those of you who may have lost that loving feeling maybe you've lost love in your relationship and you're wondering how do i get it back here's what you do you let the holy spirit bring the love of god to your heart and then you share that love with your spouse because love is what they need they need god's love through you and god wants to give it to us so that we can give it to them also, when it comes to this idea of love being spiritual, I want to remind us that love forgives. Mm -hmm. Love forgives. And love forgiving is not just something we get to choose. It's actually a command from God. I want you to hear what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 4.32. He says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. What he's saying is, Forgiveness is something we must extend to one another. Why? Because forgiveness sets us free from bitterness and resentment. It's saying, God, I let that go. I'm going to allow you to take care of that. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Forgiveness is a command and something we need to extend to them, whether they extend it back to us. But trust is built yeah. between the couple in their marriage. And trust is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Trust is a two-way street. It requires both people showing up saying, we're going to operate and work in trustworthy ways to help our relationship thrive. And that's God's design. He wants us to forgive and to move forward. And the final way to really choose love every day is to make the first move. Because love makes the first move. We see this from the life of Jesus. He chose to make the first move. God knew that we couldn't get to him. So he came to us. And he's inviting us to make the first move. Now, some of you may be saying, but Pastor John, there's so much pain. We have so much gridlock in our relationship, and we can't move forward. I'm just going to challenge you to step out in faith and say, I'm going to choose to love. Yeah. I'm going to yes. choose to love. It doesn't mean that everything's perfect or you sweep things under the rug and say, nothing ever happened. But what will happen is when you choose to make the first move like Jesus did for us, what you're saying is, I'm committed to moving forward. And that's relational physics. Once you begin to move forward, then you can move your relationship off the rails and begin to move forward in the future that God has for you. And I just want to speak to those of you who may be finding yourself in a really hard place. I want to encourage you to talk to someone. Don't do this journey alone. Find someone else you trust, a godly person. If you're part of a life group, I encourage you to talk to your life group leader. That's one of the great reasons to be a part of a life group, because you have a a believer that's there to journey with you and you're part of a fellowship of other believers who are in the same age and stage as you and they're there to encourage you and pray for you. Maybe uh, talk to someone on our pastoral team or maybe go see a professional counselor. I was a counselor for a long time and I've been to counseling before as well. And I want to reassure you 
that there are great counselors in our community. In fact, go to our family resources page and you'll find a place where you can down, download some professional counseling referrals so that you can move forward. The enemy is running and gunning after your marriage and you say, no, not yeah. today, not here, Satan. We're going to move forward. Yes. We're going to choose to love. We're going to have yes. the after I do that you have for us. Yes. And so today as I close, here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to stand. And I'll share with you what Pastor today and I, we have in our heart. What we want to do is we want to pray for you. That God would work in your life, in your marriage, and in your future. Because God's purpose is for you to move forward. And I'm just believing he's going to do that even right now. And so we want to invite you to just take an assessment right now of your relationship. Which area do you need to increase and focus on in this time? Is it the fact that you need more faith in your marriage? You need to put faith first and really build that together. Maybe you're at the place that you need hope again. You need to believe the best. You need to expect the good. Or maybe you would say, we just need to choose love every day. We've lost that. We've let it just drift away. Whichever one it is this week, focus on that. Be intentional about it. And you're going to see that God's going to move. God's going to give energy back to you. God's going to bring you closer together. And we just believe God's going to make the first move in your relationship as well. And so if you're standing by your spouse, here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to grab them by the hand. I want you to say, God, I want you to step into this. Because again, when we're unified before him, he steps in. And the three of us are able to move forward. I know for some of you that might be a hard thing to do to reach out. But I'm, inv I'm inviting you to reach out in faith. Believing that you do have a future together. And so I want to pray for you. I want to invite everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. Jesus, we come to you today. We're believing for more for these couples. We know that you have a plan and a future for them. And I pray, Lord, that they would put you first, Jesus. As they put faith first in their life, may they discover that you first will allow their relationship to thrive and you'll get the glory. I pray, Lord, you restore hope to those who have lost hope in their marriage. They feel like they can't move forward. God, may you step in and proclaim peace over them. May you pull them and draw them closer to you. Heal their hurts. Heal their wounds. Restore hope joy to their heart. And God, I pray for those who have lost love in their marriage, may you reignite it. Lord, may they welcome your love into their heart, and may they be courageous about extending that love to their spouse today and in the future. Bless your people today and these marriages in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. Can I just tell you, it's been great to have you here this weekend. We're believing for more for you. God bless you, and we're dismissed.